After attempting to cash in on the massive handheld gaming boom of the 2000s with Ace Combat Advance, Namco of course had to evaluate the game's performance and decide whether or not handheld games would be worth investing in in the future. And when all was said and done, Ace Combat Advance sold about 100,000 copies worldwide, making it still to this day the worst performing AC game financially. And for whatever reason, Namco took a look at these figures and said, yeah, let's give it another go. And with the PlayStation Portable having just been released, there was never a better opportunity for them to give it another try, leading to the creation and eventual release of what would come to be known as Ace Combat X Skies of Deception. So does Ace Combat X manage to transfer the Ace Combat formula to handheld better than Ace Combat Advance, or is it just another haphazardly thrown together spin-off to cash in on the handheld gaming trend? Well, let's talk about it. And before getting too far into the video, I should mention that this is the 8th in a series of videos where I'm playing every Ace Combat game for the first time and reviewing them as I go along. And while you don't have to have seen the rest of the videos in order to enjoy this one, you will be missing a lot of important context about my journey with the series if you haven't seen them, so I'll have the full playlist linked in the description below for those of you that want to go check those out first. But with that out of the way, Ace Combat X Skies of Deception is a combat flight simulation game developed by Access Games and published by Namco for the PlayStation Portable in 2006. The game takes place in the near future year of 2020. Oh, Jesus Christ. During a conflict between the nations of Aurelia and Laysath. The military of Laysath has invaded the country of Aurelia, and we play as Griffiths One, an ace pilot trying to retake the country and liberate our fellow citizens. And as we'll talk about throughout the video, there are numerous places in this game where compromises were made because of the hardware, but the first instance of this is actually really confusing. Something that you'll notice as soon as you start up the game is that the menus run at a very low frame rate, seeming to be capped somewhere around 15 or 20 frames per second. And while I initially assumed that it was because of the hardware of the PSP, I honestly can't imagine that it's difficult to get these simple 2D elements working at a smoother frame rate. And to make this even weirder, when you get into the gameplay itself, the frame rate cap actually increases to 30 FPS, so I really have no idea what the deal with the menus possibly could be. But getting into the gameplay, you'll notice that unlike Ace Combat Advance, Ace Combat X actually plays a lot like the home console games in the series. And by that, I mean that it plays almost exactly like the home console games. And it was super noticeable for me personally, with my favorite game in the series so far being Ace Combat 4, that the game actually plays almost identically to that game. And funnily enough, it turns out that that's because this is effectively Ace Combat 4 running on the PSP. Much like how Ace Combat Zero used Ace Combat 5 as a base, Ace Combat X uses Ace Combat 4 as a base. That being said though, AC4 ran at a locked 60 frames per second on the PS2, but like I mentioned just a minute ago, Ace Combat X is capped at 30 FPS, meaning that it feels a lot less smooth than AC4 did. And as for the rest of the presentation, the visuals are definitely scaled down from the PS2, much like you'd expect. You'll see a lot of assets from games like AC4 and AC5, but at a noticeably lower quality, and to be honest, it has this sort of low-poly charm to it. As well as that, you'll notice that a lot of the extra particle effects and smaller elements that add a lot of weight and believability to the presentation are gone, giving it this almost floaty quality that's very reminiscent of the earlier games like Air Combat or AC2. While no one will argue that it looks better than the PS2 trilogy, it really doesn't look that bad, and especially for the PSP, it has a surprisingly strong overall image. The one aspect of the presentation that genuinely annoyed me though, was the audio in this game. All of the sound files in this game are clearly heavily compressed, leading to this very crunchy, low quality sound from beginning to end. Maintain your present course. You see the enemy formation on your radar? Read you loud and clear. We're coming up on the enemy from behind, just like we planned. And I'm going to play this next clip without editing the audio whatsoever just to prove my point. So volume warning, you'll definitely want to turn down your volume a bit for this one. But God help you if a bomber manages to drop a payload near you. Oh 
but despite the generally low quality audio, the music seems to be much less compressed, and it's actually pretty good. With this game taking place in 2020, it's actually the closest game on the timeline to Ace Combat 3 aside from AC Advance, and while there are other things that feel reminiscent of AC3 in this game, which we'll come back to in a minute, the music is where I noted those similarities the most. The best way that I can describe the music in this game is if they took the general style of the PS2 trilogy's music and combined it with the more electronic sound of AC3's music. It takes that totally unique identity from AC3, but brings it to the forefront instead of letting it meander in the background like in that game, and it's some really good stuff. I mean, just take a listen and see if you can hear what I'm talking about. But getting more into the campaign itself, something that was a very pleasant surprise was the introduction of a super weapon at the end of the very first mission. This is Glepnir, a massive flying fortress that has a shockwave cannon on it that will instantly destroy any aircraft caught in the blast. We get attacked by it, and while most of our squadron is wiped out, we manage to survive and escape, but we know from this point on that Laysath has this weapon under their belt, and it's a constant thought in the back of our mind from this point on. And talking more about the story itself, it mostly feels like Air Combat and Ace Combat 2, where there isn't much of a narrative outside of the missions themselves, and the story largely exists just to give you a reason to be taking on the missions that you are. There are, however, some extra cutscenes thrown in from time to time that involve the reporter from Ace Combat 5 covering the conflict between Aurelia and Laysath. The style of these cutscenes is also incredibly reminiscent of Ace Combat 4's cinematics, and even though they're largely unimportant, only making up about 10 minutes of the game's total runtime, they're perfectly fine for what they are, just don't go into Ace Combat X expecting some deep narrative experience. But speaking of unexpected returns from previous entries, there's the mission map returning from Air Combat. And with this map returning, we also get the addition of something that I brought up as a passing idea in the very first video of this series. Meaningfully branching paths. Tackling certain missions before others will cause changes to be made to other parts of the map, potentially decreasing the difficulty of some later missions, but also potentially increasing the challenge if you ignore larger threats for too long. It's a really fun addition, and as much as I appreciate having one highly polished and curated experience, I would also really love it if this sort of thing could make an appearance in one of the future console games. And thankfully, one of my favorite changes from Ace Combat Zero also makes a return in this game. The enemy aces that you can take down to earn things like unique paint jobs for your jets can once again be found during your first playthrough here. I didn't personally end up finding very many of them during my playthrough, but I was really glad to see that this change was carried over, since if they brought it to even their spin-offs, it will likely carry forward into the mainline entries going forward. And these aces are difficult, as are a lot of the pilots in ACX, because this game has what is likely the best pilot AI in the franchise so far. Again, I should mention that I play on normal for these reviews, so I can't speak to the higher difficulties, but some of the pilots in this game on normal mode are as difficult as some of the aces from the PS2 trilogy's harder difficulties. They're much better at evading attacks and being more aggressive in this game than they have been in a very long time, and while I haven't gotten around to the higher difficulties just yet, I can definitely see this being a contender for the most difficult game in the series when playing on the ace mode. But for any Ace Combat fans that might not have played this game before, don't let that scare you away from giving this game a shot, because once you've adjusted to the lower frame rate, it genuinely feels like you're just playing an entry from the PS2 trilogy. It's basically just Ace Combat 4 with some extra planes and special weapons that were added in AC5, as well as various planes and weapons that feel straight out of Ace Combat 3. And that brings us to the most substantial addition to Ace Combat X's progression, and that's the customizable plane parts. 
With this new system, you're able to unlock and purchase individual parts such as new armor, new wings, different machine guns, etc. and combine them to put together custom builds for your planes that will drastically impact your stats. But there's an interesting catch with that, as this system is only available for the new AC-3-esque planes. This way, they can keep the majority of the game's aircraft authentic to their real-life counterparts while letting players mess around with and customize the completely fictional planes. It's a ton of fun, and realism aside, I would honestly like to see this made available for all planes in future entries just to be able to really play around with it and see what you can do. And speaking of weapons, there's a very interesting change that was made to the machine guns of Ace Combat X. It took a while for me to even notice, but the machine guns in this game have a very subtle magnetism to them, making it so that as long as you're close enough to having your reticle on target, your shots are guaranteed to hit. I'm assuming that this was included to make the machine guns more usable on the PSP's controls, as anyone who's actually used a PSP before will know that the controls on them weren't all that great, and considering you still need to be really close to the target for this to kick in, I don't think it hurts the game's core design at all, but it is something interesting that I wanted to mention since it seems to come from the platform that the game was developed for. But getting back to talking about the campaign, remember that super weapon Glepnir that I mentioned earlier? Well, I hope so, because it's a great example of something that Ace Combat X does exceptionally well, and that's the pacing. Glepnir gets introduced to us at the end of the first mission, with us needing to just run away from it for the time being, until we get to encounter it later on in what was the fourth mission during my playthrough. This time, we actually get to fight Glepnir, but after we destroy some of its weapons, it manages to get away from us. Then, even later, during what was the 8th mission of my playthrough, the enemy brings it out in desperation near the end of a battle, and this time, we manage to shoot it down for good. The designers of this game did an amazing job with knowing when to throw in those large cinematic moments, as well as knowing when to ease off the gas and throw a more standard mission at you, making it really easy to just play the game for hours at a time as those highs and lows are mixed in masterfully. Along with this, the mission variety is pretty great here. A lot of it is stuff that fans of the series will have seen before, but there's also some entirely new stuff that's really fun. My favorite example of this is a mission where we're going in to destroy some of the enemy's radar systems, but there's very strong jamming in the area, and the radar system is so well defended that we can't go anywhere near it while the defenses are still active. So when we get there, we first need to destroy the power facilities for these defenses, and because of the jamming, the only way that we can actually find these is by following the power lines that are running through the mountains, connecting them to the defenses themselves. And because of some choices that I made earlier in my campaign, when I played this mission, the enemy had their best ground troops stationed here, and they made a very active effort not just to shoot me down, but also to destroy the power lines around the map so that I couldn't use them to find the power stations. The game is full of creative new missions like this, and it's definitely one of the strengths of Ace Combat X in my opinion. But by the end of the second act of the campaign, we've managed to retake the capital of the country back from Laysath, effectively retaking the country from their occupation. However, it's then quickly revealed that the enemy has developed an entirely new type of fighter called Fenrir. And this fighter comes equipped with optical camouflage and some new experimental weapons, making it the final super weapon of the game. So throughout the third act of the game, we do what we can to weaken the enemy base where Fenrir is stationed, before attacking them and battling with a squadron of ace pilots in the Fenrir fighters in the final mission of the game. And these guys have to be one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult boss out of the entire Ace Combat series so far. The pilots are great at evading and holding aggression on the player, the optical camouflage makes it so that it takes a super long time to get a target lock for your missiles, and they fire these quick moving lightning orbs that will overheat and destroy your jet if you aren't moving quickly enough to stay ahead of them. This results in an incredibly intense dogfight where you have to move at near full speed constantly and try to line up the perfect missile shot while avoiding all of the other Fenrir fighters. It's really good stuff, and it's probably my personal favorite encounter from the series so far just because of how unique and challenging it is. But with that done, and the last remnants of Laysath's army destroyed, the game is over. So along with this, we also get a conclusion to the side story with the reporter from AC5, which is clearly one of the more rushed parts of this game. I haven't talked about this side plot much at all, and that's because it's really unimportant to the overall game. 
For absolute lore fiends, you'll get like two interesting details out of these extra cutscenes, but outside of that, they add nothing to the overall experience and are just generally uninteresting. The story that he goes through is essentially the opening cutscene where he's introduced to us as the reporter who's in the country to document the conflict, then the next time we get to hear from him he says that there might be some corruption among Laysath's higher command, and then at the end of the game he's back and says there was in fact corruption among Laysath's higher demand. We don't really get anything in terms of how he found that out or the investigative process that he went through, he just kind of proposes the idea to the audience somewhere around the midpoint in the game and then near the end he just tells us that his hypothesis was right but not really how he figured it out. It really feels like it was just thrown in at the last second or at the very least like it was meant to have a lot more depth to it and was just never given the required time or resources to be properly fleshed out. Overall, I like Ace Combat X. There's a lot of good stuff in here, and it's impressive how well they carried over the core gameplay of the PS2 entries to the PSP, but it's hard to say that this is any better than the games of that trilogy. It has some damn good gameplay and some really interesting new systems, but it's hard to shake the feeling that despite those new ideas, you're just playing a scaled back version of those games. The story, while barely present, also just feels very rushed and crammed in at the last second, which is really unfortunate because there were a lot of good ideas proposed in the story that just weren't able to be fleshed out for one reason or another. So at the end of the day, I'm going to give Ace Combat X Skies of Deception a 7.5. Hey guys, thanks for watching to the end of the video, and I hope you enjoyed this one. But don't click off the video just yet, because for those of you that do watch to the very end, I've got a special surprise for you. In the pinned comment of this video is going to be a poll for what games you would like to see covered on the channel after I finish reviewing the Ace Combat and Metal Gear franchises. This is a select all that apply kind of poll too, so rather than just picking the one franchise you would like to see covered, go through and just check the box next to anything that you would like to see me do a series on. We're still a long ways out from starting that new content, but I want to make sure that I get as many opinions as possible from those of you that support the videos the most, so we're starting nice and early. Aside from that, if you want to take your support of the channel a little further, consider checking out my Patreon page and becoming a part of the incredible group that makes this all possible. If you're looking for more Ace Combat reviews, you can check them out right here, and you might also enjoy the other series we've been doing reviewing the Metal Gear games. But once again, thank you for watching, and I'll hope to see all of you right back here next time on the next Ace Combat Review.